Welcome to the annual Lucille Austin Lecture sponsored by the Alumni Association to honor the contributions of this outstanding professor. I was so fortunate to study with her when I was very young. And while she was a teacher of clinical practice, I am very confident that she would endorse our shift to uh, focus in recent years on urgent social justice issues which impact on our clinical practice. We have addressed this committee, homelessness, immigrant children at the border, and the assault on women's reproductive rights. Sadly, nothing much has improved since those lectures on those areas. This year, our committee facing so many horrifying events that demand our attention like gun violence and rising anti-Semitism, we decided to focus on transgender issues. On April 3rd, and then again today in the New York Times, they report on the intrusion of state legislators to shrink and abolish trans health care. Our topic choice today was confirmed by the very high registration for this lecture. This is only one of the brutal assaults and violations for trans individuals. I'm very grateful to our committee, Fran Friedman, Susan Neowith, and Emily Ball Jabbar, and for the school's support with the active participation of Dean Lenard Davidson Greenwich, and most importantly, Jen March, Assistant, Associate Director of Alumni Relations. She's our glue, and anything that goes right tonight is because of her. It is my very special pleasure to introduce Dean Melissa Begg, whose public health expertise has been an invaluable ingredient of her leadership in our school in these daunting times. Thank you so much, Susan, for that introduction to tonight's event. Uh, it's always a joy uh, for me to work with our vibrant past presidents group. Uh, and I, it's my pleasure now to welcome everyone to the Columbia School of Social Works 2023 Austin Lecture. Um, this is a beautiful way to celebrate the life and contributions of Lucille Austin, who was on Columbia's faculty for more than 30 years. And we're incredibly grateful to the Kenworthy Swift Foundation for their grant and the generous contribution made in memory of Jane R. Heimerdinger. And of course, I'm really grateful to the outstanding committee of Alumni Association past presidents for bringing this together. Not just Susan Matterin, but also Francis Friedman, Susan Neowith, and Emily Jabour. We have a great program tonight because of their efforts. I'm grateful for this opportunity to share ideas, approaches, and strategies that directly impact social work and social welfare and human well being. It's critical that we maintain and enhance our community efforts to support social justice and human rights, which are central to our mission. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for this event, Dr. David Johns. Dr. Johns is the executive director of the National Black Justice Coalition, a civil rights organization dedicated to empowering Black LGBTQ plus SGL people, including folks living with HIV or AIDS. He was appointed the first executive director of the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for African Americans by President Barack Obama, and he served in this role from 2013 to 2017. Dr. Johns was a senior education policy advisor to the Senate Committee on Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions under the leadership of U.S. Senator Tom Harkin. And he also served under the leadership of the late U.S. Senator Ted Kennedy. He was also a Congressional Black Caucus Foundation Fellow in the Office of Congressman Charles Rangel. Dr. Johns has been recognized widely. He was named to the Out 100 list in 2021, Route 100 in 2013 and 2014, Ebony's Power 100 in 2015, and he received an early career award from Columbia University Teachers College in 2016. Dr. Johns received his PhD in sociology and education policy here at Columbia in 2022, and he obtained a master's degree in sociology and education policy at Teachers College, graduating summa cum laude. He graduated with honors from Columbia in 2004 with a triple major in English, creative writing, and African-American studies. Dr. Johns, uh, we are so grateful to have you join us this evening. I'm thankful for the invitation, Dean, and my hope is that if you all hear me say nothing else, I hope you hear my heart when I say thank you, uh, not only for the invitation, but for spotlighting the importance of this conversation. Here are my goals for the day. This is not in order, but we're just going to go for it. Uh, I want to 
celebrate all of you. Let me make sure I want to enlist everyone in the Love Army to defend democracy and support all the babies. So this is an emphasis on the lecture's title that includes compassion. Uh, I hope to do this by describing how I show up in the arena. I hope that I will be successful in making the case for you uh, to focus your energy on the front line in ways that I will describe throughout this talk. I will highlight opportunities to defend democracy right where you are. And I'm offering up the National Black Justice Coalition, the organization that I have the pleasure of quarterbacking um, as a resource for those who don't know. Uh, NBJC this year will be a 20 year old organization. It is the nation's only civil rights organization that is both intentional and unapologetic and acknowledging the important intersection of racial equity and LGBTQIA plus equality. Um, as was mentioned, lots of things uh, are used to describe me, uh, but most important is that anyone who knows me uh, knows that I care deeply about our babies. Um, I have been known to use the hashtag uh, teach the babies as a beseechment uh, to remind all of us that we have both an opportunity and an obligation uh, to ensure that every single child has an opportunity not only to survive, but to thrive. Uh, I want to emphasize where I started, which is to thank each of you for being in the arena. Um, I often go to this passage um, that was referenced by Brene Brown, one of my favorite authors. Uh, she took this from Teddy Roosevelt, who wrote about this um, in The Citizen and a Republic. Um, and what it really acknowledges is that it's really easy for people to criticize, um, and particularly at this moment, uh, to have a critical opinion about the work of those of us who are defending democracy and support of the needs of our children, our communities, and our country. Uh, and so again, I'll say a lot of things tonight, but in the spirit of our uh, ancestor, Maya Angelou, most of you will forget uh, what I say. Hopefully you will not forget uh, the feelings associated with the message that I am hoping to convey. Um, and that is all anchored in deep appreciation uh, for the work that each of you do. Uh, so I want to acknowledge that my title slide uh, used the word Black. I am intentional in centering uh, Blackness, not only because I understood the lesson offered by W.E.B. Du Bois, the first Black sociologist, who said that based on our lot in life, most of us should have another, no other responsibility than to think about our lot in life and to identify solutions or to hack our way out of seemingly intractable problems. Uh, and so I want to be clear in that while I will be using uh, precise terms and centering Black kids because of white supremacy, um, all of our children are our babies. Um, I've never met a child in my life, somebody let me know if you have, uh, who asked to be born. Um, and sociologist Asa Hilliard uh, reminds us that there's no secret to how we support children. We first acknowledge them as human, and then we second support them with love. Uh, but as I will illustrate over the course of my lecture, too often, too many of our children, uh, to no fault of their own, are not acknowledged as human um, and are seldom met in public spaces that they're forced to move through with love. Uh, and so before I move on, just a couple of terms to ground all of us. Uh, queer is often used as a synonym for sexual minorities in this country. Uh, the root of the word really refers to that which is not in a position of privilege. So I often remind folks that in this country, uh, women are queer, uh, uh, people with disabilities are queer, um, uh, those of us who are not native to this country are queer. Um, and so I want people to remember that it is a politic that is very much related to LGBTQIA plus people, um, uh, histories and issues, uh, but it is a term unto itself. Um, similarly, lesbian and gay are terms given to women and men, uh, separate biologically inferred gender distinctions, um, and then bisexual people are attracted to both genders. I do not use the term gay. I use the term same gender loving uh, because words matter. Often when people um, hear the word gay, they don't imagine me. They imagine a white male. Um, also, they might think about deviancy. They might think about sex. In clinical spaces, they might think about risk uh, factors or HIV. Um, seldom do people center the word love. And so I use a term created by a black man to be intentional and disrupting of some of the dynamics that are at play, and then I'll continue to foreground. Uh, and then finally, transgender is a person who lives as a member of a gender other than that which was assigned at birth. Um, and consistent with what I offered initially, uh, if there are other terms that I use, um, are words that are confusing, you can either ask at the end of the chat or visit nbjc.org as we develop the terminology guide to be helpful to anyone who seeks to 
increase their competence to demonstrate additional compassion. Uh, my work, uh, my life's work is really informed by and focused on creating space for queer, I mean it with a capital Q, so as encompassing as possible, um, students to thrive. Um, and it's also informed by the work of Bell Hooks, lowercase b, lowercase h. She was intentional in wanting people to focus on her works, um, who in one of her works teaching uh, critical thinking foregrounds the fact that too often we forget that democracy is something that is required for, to, to defend by every single generation. Um, and if there's ever been a point in my life where I think that's been clear, um, it is now. Um, I focus my doctoral studies on describing and really learning more about the experiences of Black students who identify as or who might be perceived as LGBTQIA+, uh, in part because I spent a decade on Capitol Hill and the experiences of Black queer students were often rendered invisible. Often advocates and educators and well-intentioned, uh, compassionate adults um, spoke about Black students as if they were all cisgendered and heterosexual, which has never been the case. And conversely, advocates working on behalf of LGBTQIA plus students and issues often spoke about them as if they were all white, which has also never been the case. Um, I found it frustrating as a doctoral student across the street from the social work building at Teachers College that five of the largest national data sets used to inform not only conversations about education and the systems around them, but funding towards systems of education as well, do not contemplate children and their whole identities. Um, when we ask students questions about their experiences in schools, we don't account for their sexual identities, gender orientations, or expressions. And conversely, when individuals ask research questions connected to sexual identity, gender orientation, or expression, we're not always thinking about their location and the spaces that we force them to move through. Uh, so my dissertation sought to um, not only acknowledge, but to disrupt um, those dynamics and to foreground the experiences of students who too often are neglected and ignored. I wanna underscore the point for anyone who missed it that democracy is under attack. Uh, it is always under attack, uh, but now more than ever, uh, there are individuals who are in positions of power who are doing all they can to dismantle um, democratic institutions and practices. Um, I wanna highlight um, two uh, pieces of evidence in this regard. One is that uh, throughout the United States, there is a disproportionate representation of older, cisgendered, uh, presumably heterosexual white men who are in elected offices. And this is despite continued, and in some cases, rapidly changing demographics. Uh, one question that I hope everyone will ask themselves, not only throughout the course of my lecture, but in the days that come is, who benefits from the hoarding of power that we see happening all around us at present today? Um, what happens when people are told uh, and otherwise encouraged to not uh, work woke or to think critically? Uh, I wanna highlight that defending democracy is foundational to sociology and submit as evidence uh, of that, Mary Church Terrell and Dorothy Height, uh, both black women who use their positionality and power to fight for and advocate for the advancement of both civil rights and women's rights. Um, Dorothy Hyde is someone who did that, um, leveraging many of the principles that I know helped to form the foundations of study and practice at Columbia. Um, and those practices continue through organizations like Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated and NCNW. I highlight that not only to make connections between what are often thought about as separate disciplines, but to highlight the importance of engaging with institutions who understand the importance of doing this work as well. Classrooms across Florida have become ground zero for America's latest culture war. This week, the College Board revised its new AP African American Studies course, cutting out material that Governor Ron DeSantis argued was a Trojan horse for left wing ideology. The board insists it did not give in to political pressure and that these revisions were long planned. But the changes to the course directly impact subjects that were long under fire from Republican and Florida officials. The new course excludes topics like Black Lives Matter, Black Queer Studies, and the debate over reparations from its exam and are now only listed as options for research projects. This week, Ron DeSantis also announced he plans to ban state universities from spending funds on diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives. This all comes as Florida continues to be the 
epicenter of new anti-LGBTQ legislation taking place throughout the country. Joining me now is David Johns, director of the National Black Justice Coalition, and Rodrigo Heng Layton, executive director for the National Center for Transgender Equality. So thank you both for being here. David, I want to start with you. The college board is saying we did not give in. Other people, critics of this, are saying you watered this down to, to make sure that the Republican, including Ron DeSantis, that they were happy. What do you make of the consequences of this, the impact this is going to have, especially on students who are talking about their lived experiences? Yeah, I appreciate the question. I want to name how frustrated I am that we're talking about this in Black History Month and not all of the good Black news we could be talking about. The spirit of James Baldwin is with me, talked about to be Black and relatively conscious in America, so almost always be in a constant state of rage. And I am enraged that DeSantis has engaged in an all-out attack on academic freedom, on free speech, and on core pillars of democracy, including public school. We got here because this is simply a manifestation of white nationalism. Uh, our public schools have been under attack, and DeSantis deciding that his history is the core curriculum, while parts of my history are maybe at some point offered as an elective, is a reflection of white nationalism. What I know as a Black same loving man is that you cannot talk about Black history without naming the work of Byron Rustin, the architect of the Civil Rights Movement and the March on Washington in 63. You cannot talk about feminism structure or struggle without naming Martha P. Johnson, the Black trans woman who helped to spark the Stonewall Rebellion. It is not possible to move past acknowledging that wherever there is history, there's Black history, and wherever there's Black history, it's always been clear AF. Specific to your question about the college Board, one of the things that enrages me most is the capitulation of adults in positions of power. The College Board is a century-year-old organization that decided to engage in this process being politically ignorant to the fact that DeSantis has created conditions that make it difficult for teachers to want to teach these topics to begin with. That's created conditions where libraries have emptied shelves because they are worried about tripping over an intentionally vague policy. We should all be concerned because at the core, this is about disrupting democracy and preventing the kind of civil discourse that so many people in the Santos party feel when they talk about freedom of speech. And Rodrigo, so many people agree with what David is saying. It's about intersectionality. It's about not erasing queer people from the history, Black history, all history. I offer that simply as additional evidence of the points that I am making and want to ground this again in the importance of us demonstrating compassion for our babies. Um, last year in May, um, I was able to celebrate having earned uh, my doctorate degree. Uh, and after walking out of Arthur Ashe Stadium, uh, which many of you know is where the graduation festivities are held, I heard someone uh, call me not by the name I was expected to be called, which is David, uh, but called me Mr. Johns. Uh, and anyone who knows uh, your relationship with your children or your clients, um, some voices you will never forget. Uh, and this is a picture I took with my babies, uh, who was Ernie, uh, but who was not Ernie at the time, uh, opportunity to teach them. Uh, and I make this point often, uh, hoping um, when I go to sleep at night that I did everything I could uh, to support my babies as they engage in the process of figuring out who they are in the world that they're forced to move through. Um, and I submit that each of us have Ernie's um, in our lives that may or may not invite us in, that may, who may or may not share critically important parts of who they are and how they show up in the world but each of us should be committed to doing the work required so that they can be happy, healthy, and whole. Underscoring the point that schools are hostile spaces for queer students, to date there have been 469 pieces of anti-LGBTQ legislation introduced across more than 42 states uh, throughout the country. The vast majority of those bills target trans students and schools. It is nearly impossible for one who has the privilege of mobility to find a safe space in our country. Um, and the most recent expansion of the Don't Say Gay Bill in Florida, which was initially proposed as being totalizing and encompassing in the way in which it was most recently adjusted, should serve as an example of not only what is happening throughout our country, but what is possible. To back up, public schools have never been designed for Black or queer, which can sometimes be synonym students to thrive. Um, I submit our country's history with segregation and anti-Blackness 
as depicted in the left with Bull Connor um, as an example of that. Um, and he who I will no longer name, uh, but the 46th governor of the state of Florida on the right. Um, uh, most folks know, uh, but I think it important to name for those who might not, uh, that public education in our country began as something for privileged elites or children of privileged elites. And it was the introduction of the Industrial Revolution that uh, introduced uh, systems of sorting and selecting students that was modeled after European systems of preserving privilege that resulted in us being where we are today. As a result of these choices and our refusal to lean into intersectionality, um, not the term uh, that has been bastardized by uh, 46 or others, uh, but the term offered by Patricia Hill Collins, uh, who talks about intersectionality as a practice that has been enjoyed by indigenous communities for hundreds of centuries. Um, it's a way for us to think about the many ways in which our identities come into focus and shape our lives and experiences. Uh, for Black students in particular, they experience oppression that is based on, at a minimum, their racial slash ethnic identity as well as their sexual minority status. Uh, this is to say that um, while growing up, I used to hear that uh, sticks and stones may break bones, but words will never hurt. Um, that's actually not true. Words are, uh, they matter. Um, Toni Morrison talked about them as things. Um, and we know that they have a profound impact upon how, how our students are seen and the experiences they have in the spaces they're forced to move through. Um, Lancey McCready is a researcher who offered up um, a theory that suggested that uh, students who have multiple marginalized identities are often faced with a false choice. Uh, in the experiences of Black LGBTQIA plus or same gender loving students, um, they are often forced to choose between their race or their sexual identity a gender orientation or expression. What that means, for example, is that prior to the most recent attacks on what would previously be termed safe spaces for students, Black, queer, trans, and non-binary students were forced to choose between going to the BSO or Black Students Organization meeting, for example, or the space that is held for gay, straight alliances. Acknowledging all of this, my research really focused on identifying the space where our babies are often missed. Um, there is a significant amount of research that talks about the experiences of Black students. A significant amount of that research focuses on the experiences of Black male students who are presumed to be cisgender to heterosexual. There similarly is a body of research focused on LGBTQ or queer students. A lot of that research, as I previously stated, focuses on white students in major metropolitan areas. There's a smaller body of research that focuses on informal educational programs, activities, these are um, um, courses, um, classes, and activities that are offered outside of the traditional curriculum. And my research really focused in on the spaces where each of those intersect. My research questions were, what is the relative impact of these important variables that researchers suggest are important for determining students' experiences in schools and in communities? Uh, and in particular, I wanted to know whether or not there was something different in the experiences of Black students who identify as trans or non-binary or non-conforming as compared to students who identify as gay, uh, lesbian, or bisexual. Um, to conduct my research, I engaged in a mixed methods uh, study where I was able to use uh, GLSEN data. Uh, GLSEN is an organization that provides a school climate survey. It's a private data set. Uh, this was me troubling the previous acknowledgement that the large educational data sets don't ask questions that allow us to have these kinds of conversations or reflect upon opportunities to support students in this way. And to supplement that data collection or analysis, rather, I engaged in my own qualitative data collection. Employing intersectionality was really important for me with regard to using mixed methods. I found something specific to trans students that I'll name in the next slide that I would not have been able to find if I did not do that. Um, four top line findings that I'll spend the balance of this lecture underscoring are that age is significant. The safe space symbols matter in particular for black trans and non-binary and non-conforming students. Respect matters significantly to Black trans, non-binary, and non-conforming students, especially. Um, and we'll work in reverse. So a key finding was that Aretha was right. And for anyone who's not uh, like picking up on the reference, this is Aretha Franklin. 
Uh, she talked about respect and what the data showed was that respect matters significantly for Black trans students. Uh, uh, feeling that their teachers, that their classmates, that the individuals in the community respected them often determined whether or not they showed up in school or participated in programs that were offered to them. Uh, and this is something that my research has found that adults don't always acknowledge our value or identify as a significant priority. These are the four um, top lines I referenced earlier. When accessible, um, these programs that are supposed to be safe spaces for Black queer students or for queer students more specifically are beneficial um, to these students. Uh, mental health uh, supports must be available to students for reasons that I mentioned before and for some that I'll overemphasize in a minute. Um, colorism is real and toxic. This was one of the surprises. In my study, it was not something that I anticipated finding, but every participant that I spoke to talked about the importance of colorism. Uh, and for those who might be unfamiliar with the term, colorism helps to tell the story of how uh, white supremacy and transatlantic enslavement in this country created conditions where Black people who have lighter skin are offered access to or perce perceived as having access to privilege that darker skin members of our community don't have. And all the students in my study highlighted that not only are these conversations that we should be having, but adults should be equipped to deal with the complications and challenges that colorism presents. Um, and then finally, uh, Black women are powerful yet under supported resources. Anyone who is in meaningful and authentic relationship with a Black woman will not be surprised by that finding at all. So specific to uh, thriving, um, it's important for us as a community of folks who think about place-based work to reimagine what it means uh, to be safe. Um, the students in my study uh, really emphasize the importance of us learning to be comfortable in the uncomfortable, doing the tough work to have conversations that might not be commonplace, uh, and to shift the way that we think about safety, uh, which often reaffirms the privileges that people have when they're attacking or otherwise marginalizing LGBTQIA plus our queer people. Uh, related to that, uh, a number of my students referenced a Drake lyric when talking about nice for whom and nice for what. There was this understanding that often when students had access to spaces that were supposed to be designed for radically queer conversations, they weren't that. Um, there were places where people had superficial or surface level conversations and never really shifted to becoming dynamic in ways that allow for them to be safe. Lack of access to these spaces that I'm describing as safe often results in our students experiencing trauma. Um, so very much related to mental health and the importance of us focusing there. Um, one, Black youth suicide rates have doubled over the last two decades. Um, again, acknowledging that children don't ask to be born, this statistic should be troubling to anyone, uh, including because the suicide rates for every other community of children are decreasing. Um, and this stat um, uh, was true before the novel coronavirus. And so we should imagine that there has been additional exacerbation um, in the time since. Um, as has been mentioned and hopefully is understood, uh, Black students with multiply marginalized identities face compounded challenges that often result in exacerbated uh, mental health trauma. Um, and in particular, Black trans and non-binary or non-conforming youth face unique mental health challenges. Um, the Trevor Project recently released a study, a unique study in its focus on Black trans, uh, gender nonconforming, and non-binary students, and they found that one in every four Black trans, non-binary, non-conforming, a young person has contemplated suicide within the last year. Um, all this to say that we must prioritize mental health, um, and with regard to the finding around age being significant, we have to do more early. Um, many of the students in my study, the participants, um, talked about either not having access to meaningful mental health support. Um, and if they did, it was reserved until they were in high school. Um, that was complicated by the fact that most of my participants talked about early exposure uh, to trauma. For example, one of my participants talked about being called a faggot in kindergarten uh, and seeking support to understand what that meant um, and how they felt as a result of it for years without being able to find that kind of support. 
All of this provides us with opportunities to reimagine uh, supports and schools um, at the same time. And in particular for us to work with young people in particular people who are most marginalized to engage them in conversations around what safety looks like. I think this is incredibly important as we talk about trans students in particular. Um, NBJC has an initiative called Stolen Lives. Um, Stolen Lives exists to record the names and encourage accountability around trans folks who have been murdered. Um, and every year for the last five years that I've had the pleasure of quarterbacking the team at the National Black Justice Coalition, it has been the deadliest year on record for Black trans women in particular. The average life expectancy for Black trans women and girls is 30. Um, and too often their murders go um, uninvestigated, um, not solved, and often um, not even discussed. There have been two Black trans women that we know of who have been murdered in the city of Atlanta um, in just the last two weeks. Uh, very much related to a previous observation, colorism is real and toxic. And my hope is that uh, if you have not yet thought about it, this is an invitation uh, to not only learn more, but to identify strategies and practices to engage in disrupting it. Also, anyone who watches reality TV, this was a hot topic on The Real Housewives of Potomac. One of the things that I love most is talking about uh, this, which is a sub chapter in my dissertation titled Black Women Are Responsible for Everything Beautiful in the World. Um, they are and they deserve additional um, support. Um, this is true in classrooms as well as in clinical settings um, and other settings that I know social work workers occupy. Um, most of the participants in my study named Black women um, as the singular resource that enabled them um, to survive the spaces that they were forced to move through. Um, and many of them talked about acknowledging that Black women did this um, without additional support um, and with extreme additional cost to the labor that they often provided. Uh, and so my hope is that the takeaway from here is that while there are challenges um, at every level to continuing to prioritize the work around uh, what traditionally is referred to as DEI or DEI and belonging or equity and inclusion more generally, uh, that we continue to focus on um, the importance of celebrating um, and strengthening diversity, um, not only in theory, but in practice, the space where policy meets practice. Uh, this matters now more than ever, um, in particular because the demographics of social workers continues to be stagnant, while the demographics of our beautifully diverse country continue um, to change. You all know this uh, much more than I do, uh, but my hope is that this will be an affirmation on work that is being done to ensure uh, that there is more diversity within the profession, um, but also that um, those of us who are not members of racial, ethnic, um, our social minority communities also understand the importance of doing the work to be competent. Um, uh, not being a member of a minoritized community um, should not be an excuse for lack of competence. Um, and specific to this point, my hope is that the School of Social Work um, and all related partners are investing in and finding ways to support uh, Black women and girls um, in every way possible. So what? Um, so I want to remind us all, and I hope that um, this lecture helps to anchor um, a commitment to ensuring that we all show up um, prepared to resist when necessary and to take calculated risks on behalf of the children and families and communities um, that we serve. Um, I often go to a sermon that was offered by Dr. Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, who preached a sermon at Ebenezer Baptist Church um, called But If Not. Um, and in this sermon, he shares a story of Meshach, Shadrach, and Abignego uh, who resist the pressure of a king who is compelling folks to bow down to his statue. Um, and these three young men uh, know and believe fundamentally um, that that is not right, um, that they exist in a space and time where they should not engage in that action, um, and they are prepared to sacrifice as a result of it. Um, and I know that I'm having a conversation with the congregation because all of you elected to be here uh, to engage in us having uh, this conversation. And so my hope is that um, you go back to this in the moments where you were challenged, uh, when it's easy to choose your privilege over doing the thing that makes you just uncomfortable, um, when it becomes more compelling um, to say nothing rather than to speak full truth to power. My hope is that you resist, um, not only for yourself, but on behalf of the 
the clients you serve, the, the children that you uh, care about in the country um, that I also hope that you love as much as I do. My hope is that you also just listen. Uh, I believe that you will hear that I'm not the only one saying this, that our babies are making um, similar demands. Um, so now what? Um, four things that I will leave you with. Uh, one is to co-construct solutions with those most in need and those least supported. Um, Dr. Comer called those the least of these. Uh, and I want to encourage everyone to center queer students, again, remembering the ontological roots of that word, um, centering those who are furthest away from power, but who are most affected by the decisions that people in power continue to make. Um, each of us have an obligation, I believe, I will argue, um, and really opportunities to understand um, the histories, the ways of making meaning of my, uh, minoritized people, um, and to do so well and consistently in praxis. Um, I want to name and celebrate the work of Yolanda Silly Ruiz, who's across the street at Teachers College, uh, who helps to ground this um, in practice. And if anybody um, is looking for a course to take or ways to go further, uh, please tell her that I sent you. Uh, and then finally, my hope is that you are all thinking about ways to provide um, support for exposure to trauma early. Um, and when in doubt, ask the babies. Um, these are pictures from uh, uh, reflective of periods over the course of my career. Uh, and one of the things that I'm most proud of is that when I served our country um, at the pleasure of President Barack Hussein Obama, his beautiful wife, Michelle Yvonne Robinson Obama, uh, their kids, Sasha Malia, um, I refused to allow adults to have conversations about young people without young people being present, um, in part because uh, one, uh, children keep us honest, uh, but often the things that adults identify um, as important are not the things that children have already prioritized. Uh, and so my hope is that you all are leveraging the young people, the experts in their own lived experiences uh, to help solve seemingly intractable problems, uh, to improve your practice, um, and to help you find ways to experience joy as well. I want to offer these resources in addition to myself and the National Black Justice Coalition um, to help uh, further your thoughts about things that I might inspire, um, to help you address some things that I might have said uh, that frustrated you um, and or things that help to illuminate uh, the pathway forward in terms of strengthening our democracy. And finally, uh, I will end as I began, which is to say thank you. Um, my hope is that if we all do this right, um, the young people you know and encounter can experience the joy uh, of these young people. Uh, one of the toughest things that I accomplished while serving um, as the executive director of the White House Initiative on Educational Excellence for African Americans was producing a first of its kind convening for African American LGBTQIA plus youth. Um, this was the night before the Pulse nightclub massacre. Um, the young people had gathered in the Indian Treaty Room uh, to celebrate having spent 48 hours developing an agenda that a number of national organizations committed to focusing on uh, in the years that followed. Um, we did not know that we would go to sleep um, this night and wake up to the massacre that happened at Pulse or the massacres uh, that have happened since. Um, but I go back to this video often to hold on to the sense of joy um, and safety um, and protection that we felt in this space. Uh, and my hope is that it will fuel you as you continue to do this work going forward. Well, Dr. John, you took my breath away. And the way you focus on babies is so despairing given the state of maternal health care for African-American women and that a little boy, African-American, gets shot ringing a doorbell just a week or two ago, maybe, uh, not to mention the gun violence in the school, which affects all children. So uh, thank you. I don't know how to say thank you for grounding us and anchoring us um, and shaping this panel today. We we owe you so much. Um, just thank you so much. And I know you're going to get lots of response and questions. And thank you. And good luck being, let me just say, in Miami, we're all trying to send a protection around you of, you know, good vibes. I need it. Thank you. Okay. Dr. David Goldenberg is a psychiatrist and psychoanalyst in Manhattan. 
He is on the faculty of Wild Cornell uh, Medical College, where I work, and the New York Psychoanalytic Institute. At the medical school, he teaches in the brain and behavior course. And at the Institute, he has taught various courses and served as a director in the psychodynamic psychotherapy program. He's co-taught Freud's case studies in the analytic training program. He is currently teaching theoretical and technical aspects of child analysis in a tri-institutional child and adolescent analytic training program in New York. He's written book reviews for the Journal of the American Psychoanalytic, and he's participated on panels on psychoanalysis and digital He's presented papers on digitally mediated dating, and he's currently writing about homophobia, misogyny, and a revision of psychodynamic theories of gender development. In his private practice, Dr. Goldenberg sees adults and adolescents. I can't conceal the fact that he helped me tremendously on my first family case with an individual in transition, but I should also say that he's been a close personal friend of mine. And it brings me great joy to bring to you someone who's so expert and such a humanist. Welcome, Dr. Goldenberg, to the School of Social Work and the Alumni Conference. Thank you, Sue. That's um, very generous of you. And I could not have done the work that I did with Sue without Sue's insight and patience and help as well. And um, thank you uh, for having me here. And thank you to um, Dr. Johns, who's gifted us with challenging ourselves and society and even how we self-identify, I think, with his uh, uh, example of self-identification. One of the things he said was being uncomfortable in the uncomfortable spaces. And so how are we gonna have meaningful conversations about that? Is certainly the uncomfortable spaces now are being co-opted by the loudest voices and by far the loudest voices in this area that we're talking about are on the right evidenced by the current right now social and health emergency of anti-trans laws targeted at children and adolescents. And so when I, um, my, my remarks are being focused on children and adolescents from a psychological perspective, primarily psychodynamic and psychiatric. And um, hopefully the result of this talk or these talks this evening will be that we can co-construct, as Dr. John said, solutions with those most in need and least supported. So basically we all are going through something together, something very unknown in many respects, and we have to traverse the adversity and come up with solutions. Um, and one of the things that you mentioned as well was language. And again, who do, what do we call ourselves, but who do we call experts and who funds the experts has been a current crisis. And that's um, who's speaking most loudly and who's influencing whom. So I'd refer you very practically to the WPATH, the World Professional Association for Trans Health, um, the Standards of Care 8. Um, it's very, very, it's very comprehensive about trans health and uh, with practical recommendations and references. And also what people seem not to realize, well, people, maybe you all do, I hope, is that there is actually a textbook, Pediatric Gender Identity from 2020. Um, and it is also a resource that helps guide our decision-making and our ability to sit and help um, these children and adolescents. Um, so I was going to talk a bit about gender development. Of course, there's not enough time to go into a whole course on gender development as sort of a lifetime, but very briefly, uh, three ways of thinking about gender are, uh, well, we have to distinguish between, of course, gender identity and gender development, but there are three broad groups of thinking about gender development, essentialist, which is, um, it's inherent within your self um, biologically, environmentalist or constructionist, constructionism, which is the emphasis on societal practices, creating the gender differentiation, and then constructivist, which is more of an interaction between the biological and environmental cues and how they are then internalized and um, the individual develops thinkings and thoughts and scaffoldings about gender then. Um, and 
from these views can help determine how you approach any individual's ideas about gender and your own thoughts and experiences. When working with a gender diverse or gender nonconforming individual or trans individual, one of the things that we recognize as the largest obstacle often is our own countertransference to that individual and also our reactions and transference to the society and what's going on around us. So there are two fantasies that seem really prevalent. One is that when someone pre presents to us, one fantasy is that, gee, if we just treat the gender, then everything gets better. And that's a fantasy that could exist within ourselves or within the patient. And the other is that if we just give them enough time to work things out or you know everything would get better or that and um we know that neither is really true and so treatment needs to be very individualized and based on some of the um experiences of people who are really expert in the field um i want to jump to something about um what we know these children and adolescents go through and how it's been measured uh there's something we all know about the minority stress model, or I hope we do, and um, that is um, pioneered by you know Meyer and articulated by Meyer. Um, and it is we know that minority stress is LGBT specific as well as race specific. And then there's an extension called the gender. Out of that has grown um, some work by Testa and colleagues called the uh, Gender Minority Stress and Resilience Measure. It's a mouthful, GMSR, and it's got eight constructs that are important to this um, model, plus a ninth that is called non-affirmation gender identity. And um, seven of these gender minority stress factors, seven of these total factors are gender minority stress factors, and two are resilience factors. So now, you know, the title of the talk actually directed me to resilience. And at first I was focusing purely on gender development, gender identity development, and some of that work. And then I we looked at the title of tonight, and it's how do we build resilience? And there were only two factors in the measurements about building resilience. One was community connectedness, which I think Dr. Jones really addressed directly, and social work addresses much more than my field, and pride, identity pride. And these are the two factors that help what is resilience and what does resilience mean for a gender nonconforming or a gender diverse or trans youth. And we think, how can they navigate that and how can we help them navigate the stressors that are inherent in society and maybe even inherent in the body and then help to dis in body and mind and help to distinguish those? How do we help the individual distinguish them? And how can we as therapists distinguish them? There are actually some recent articles to, because people don't really know, but there's a question, oh, does gender diversity, gender nonconformity immediately mean um, uh, some identity diffusion? No, is the short answer to be rather blatant. But there, and because we look at the way, the more you work with gender, the more you realize that gender, even gender nonconformity or gender fluidity can be stable and a stable construct over the course of development or relatively stable mapping onto what is developmentally appropriate for children and adolescents. Um, and we begin to look at that and to separate it out from other syndromes and even gender diverse and gender nonconforming and trans people can also have other um, diagnoses and mental health issues, um, which are not attributable to gender and also do not lead to gender related issues. But we have to work with the individual to sort those out and not come from a place of the cisgender bias that says that getting someone back on track means getting them on a cisgender track. And that's where we have to reflect on our own biases and the biases that are built into almost, you know, most of the gender um, literature in psychology, or at least in psychoanalysis. A few names to note about that are working against that certainly um, with more progressive models are um, Aaron Saft, uh, Avi Sakabatoholo, and um, Goslin. Uh, so 
and I can send those out or make them available. And also, Willa France is uh, an, an analyst working on a new theory of gender, and if and her idea, which is central to this thinking too, is all gender development for everybody it involves trauma. And this is not this is something that seems self evident to people who have traversed any kind of gender or even often sexual orientation um, nonconformity, and yet it is not really universally accepted. But if you think about it, every point along development is going to involve loss, including gender. And depending on how you define trauma with a big T or little t, um, it could be those losses and those foreclosures of the potentiality, those are losses that people have to tra traverse. And so all gender development is a space that can involve um, discordance or concordance and continuity. And so I think we have to look at that as we're saying, as we're met with a, someone who's gender nonconforming or potentially trans or straight you know, or cisgendered, excuse me, I you know, continue to make these issue, errors. Um, where, what is their history? What is the history for this specific child? Where are they now? And not to make the mistake that I said about the fantasies that everything will be solved if we solve the gender issue or the gender or the, what I think is a more problematic basic assumption that all the gender issues go away if we just treat depression or if we just treat whatever anxiety or even trauma. There is certainly, this is a, a, a split or just a discrepancy in the psychological community and it led to a huge controversy that played out in England at their gender clinic. And some of the authors there have said, um, have published to the point being, you know, if you, that gender issues are manifestations of other pathologies. Certainly that could be true, but it's not the, the, the bulk of gender nonconformity, gender and trans issues are certainly not all borderline or autism or anything like that. This is a sidebar. Yes, there's an increased representation of gender nonconforming and uh, trans identities in the autistic population, but there's also a thought that maybe that's because they're more free to discover their own gender innately and to pick and choose what comes from the outside. There's a counter argument, but um, that they just don't get it because they aren't good at um, picking up on social cues, but I'm more aligned with the former. Um, so anyway, going back, um, we need to look at our own, I've, I've repeated this, our own approaches and our own biases and build um, and, and look at the stress that the individual is under to distinguish what, um, how they're manifesting their stress and where does gender fit into their overall development? And when we look at stress, we also look at um, with the uh, minority stress models, distal stress, like external factors, distal stress are external factors, direct experiences of discrimination, rejection, violence, et cetera, and proximal or internal factors. And we look at, um, which is um, fear of further victimization, discrimination, um, and mistrust of others, internalized negative beliefs about one's identity, such as internalized homophobia or internalized transphobia, the stress of concealing one's identity. And it's the dynamic between these that lead to all sorts of symptoms that have been um, clearly um, researched, you know, stress, anxiety, depression, and suicide. Regarding, regarding these last, last markers of stress, um, anxiety, depression, and suicide, they tend to map, Hudson Bueller is the researcher who has mapped these um, uh, poor mental health outcomes onto zip codes that have the highest level of what I would term repressive, that's not the researcher's term, uh, but repressive and constraining laws. So how would we build resilience? Um, those laws don't build resilience. What builds resilience is giving as much freedom and liberatory expression to the individual child and adolescent, as well as support um, and community support, social support. Um, that's the way that, and also along with that, just enough, and anyone who's been a parent, and ideally anyone who's been parented, could think that you, know, you get just enough adversity to 
build resilience and self-esteem. So, and that adversity shouldn't come from, have to come from, how do I navigate the bullies at school? Um, it shouldn't come from, how strongly can I suppress or hide my identity? The, you know, and so it can come from just regular achievements that are natural to development. And everyone's, you know, even everyone's going to have those um, adversities as long as we just, um, but not to put extra traumatic ones in the way. Um, so uh, I, let me get back to then just what I was um, going, I wanna make sure I hit some of the ideas that I think have been, you've come here for. Um, so that basically there are different psychodynamic understandings of gender nonconforming and trans children and adolescents, but mostly uh, these are changing and they are in evolution now. Um, and that it, I, community psychodynamic and psychoanalytic community is not of one voice, but there is a general agreement that we should in some way give children and adolescents space. Now, what does this translate into? It is unrealistic to think that everybody's going to enter into intensive treatment that allows them to really be known and to know and that there's enough therapists and resources and time and everything. But what we can do is say, you know, that we generally spread the idea of giving children space. This can also relate to some degree of childism, taking the children where they are, meeting them where they are and the adolescents and really knowing what is developmentally okay and not taking all gender as a symptom. When we look at the statistics about gender conforming uh, and trans and gender non-conforming children and adolescents and who persists or desists, meaning who continues to be gender non-conforming and who stops being gender non-conforming, it means we, we, we look at statistics, but the statistics are outdated and took into account um, as desisting or meaning stopping being gender non-conforming. That took into account people, children and adolescents who presented for treatment or were forced into treatment because they were non-conforming, but not because they were trans. So when we look at the desistance data, it currently doesn't, the, the most recent data shows virtually no desistance and regret because the um, selection is so careful. But the older data that shows potentially higher desistance, although there is no um, agreement on the data, um, includes people who just, uh, children and adolescents who might just be non-conforming, but not have any real conflict. And they were pathologized. And the way to not pathologize the non-pathologized is simply in some ways to ask them and to get to know them, even children. Um, and so this translates very practically then into when do we intervene? So with children, it's social interventions and support and transitioning and acceptance as well as exploration. We get into some conflict about when to start puberty blockers and then when to allow surgery. And when do, and I don't even like that terminology. I think that there's a real problem with the whole gatekeeper model right now. However, it's what we have to work with. And puberty blockers is a point where some people say, hey, they really do give children space so that they um, can then really work out any conflicts they have that may be related to gender and that they are terrified of um, not being able to work out or will that not be solved through puberty. There's another fantasy as well as a relative uh, argument to be heard um, in the conversation that adolescence is an organizing experience. That you traverse adolescence and its struggles and it helps organize your gender identity as well as many other aspects of identity. And right now there's a, thing, a, 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 a conversation about don't prescribe puberty blockers because it doesn't allow, this is a controversy, doesn't allow for that um, organizing experience of adolescence. The problem is that who are we allowing or not allowing them for in this latter argument? Um, if, we, it, if we don't allow puberty blockers, which these laws don't allow, um, then we're taking people who are kids and early adolescents 
who are and allies who are really genuinely suffering. And we can't underemphasize the risk, not only of suicide, which has been taken to an extreme by some people who's criticizing and saying, oh, you know, that the pro-trans are overstating the suicide risk. But also, what does it mean to go into adolescence with a history of anxiety and depression and that are men, that are gender related to the interface of your gender and the world and the world sort of oppressing you and how much of that has been internalized. So if you take a child who is and really distressed around gender or has a diagnosis that is gender related, gender nonconforming, or trans, and they, and I'd like to throw in there, we should look at cis gender as also a, if not a pathology, a compromised formation, which is sort of technical, but all gender identity is a compromise, I would say. Um, but if we look at these kids and deny them puberty blockers and say, adolescents will be organizing, then we're asking kids with already a bit of a, um, too much of a stress burden to be organized through adolescence. And we haven't really studied that yet. And the comparison group is kids entering adolescence with some sort of issues and then they'll get organized. But the right comparison group is really um, anxious, depressed and suicidal adolescents through, um, sorry, children enter adolescence and what happens to that anxiety, depression, and suicidality over the course of that, especially when it's gender and self-related. That might be a bit jargony, but we can address some of that in the Q&A. Um, so I think that this is, this is an active discussion right now. Um, and we, as mental health practitioners, really have to know the limitations of our scope of practice. This is where I think that there's a problematic issue about being gatekeepers, but what can we do to help the individual child or adolescent, and it's generally working with their families, working with their families, and sometimes even you know working with the schools. Many schools like here in New York are against that, you know, say, let's, I mean, there are great schools in New York, and then in, there's some cases where a parent will go and say, this is my child um, now presenting this way and living this way, and this could help the school understand the school says, I'm not interested. Well, that's a tragedy, you know, that our schools can't. Like when the construct, the social construct is pathology, how come we can't change that? And that obstacle to changing and the obstacle to being confronted reflects to me the fears, the terrifying fears that are both counter-transferential and reactions when people are confronted with gender nonconformity or non-cisgender uh, children and adolescents. There's a terror that ensues as, and the opposite side is a rush to, you know, the, the, the um, cartoon uh, is that there's like, uh, and the oversimplifications that there's like, if someone shows up, the adolescent, they're unhappy. And then after 15 minutes, they get hormones. It doesn't really work that way. And we should know that that's not how it works. So um, I think that um, I, I was supposed to respond mostly to um, Dr. Johns. His talk is really, really great, but I do want to, and I showed up thinking I was going to talk about like, uh, youth, adolescence, and how to build resilience. And I think then going back to his talk, we can really think more. He gives us the way to build resilience, which is, you know, sort of caring babies, caring about the babies. Again, like Sue said, I love that language and, um, and the community and making change that supports the most vulnerable among us instead of constricts and um, then amplifies their um, stress, anxiety, and depression, and other symptoms. Um, okay. So I hope we get to talk about that, uh, or some of this, and, and there's a, sort of a lot, um, and I think we can then talk about it more in the Q&A. Thank you, David. Okay, on the screen. Yep, thank you. 
Uh, I can already see in the chat, people are finding both, all these lectures just fabulous. And I know there are a lot of social workers there that are very jealous that I get to work with you. <laughs> you don't have time to work with us all, but I know there are going to be people kind of jealous that I have access to you. And I just want to mention that you helped me so with a family because the families are not all cruel, rejecting, and bigoted. Some of them are really compassionate and kind, but overwhelmed and don't know really how to help a child go through this. They're not all badly intentioned parents. There are a lot of bad parents out there, but some of the babies have good parents and they just are overwhelmed. So thank you. It was just wonderful and um, so helpful to have the data and uh, recognize that we need data and research rather than kind of knee-jerk reactions to everything. So thank you so much. Uh, we'll talk to you more in the Q&A. Um, Audrey Swanson. Hi, Sue. Hi. Okay. Uh, I don't want to embarrass you, but I think I could say that you might be the most important person on this panel. Firstly, you're a graduate of Columbia class of 2012. Bravo. <laughs> um, you've done wonderful work since graduation on aging and uh, administrative positions. Uh, you've worked for, in programs helping the most vulnerable older New Yorkers and their families. You directed the Bronx Jewish Community Council's program in Pelham Parkway and the director of adult day program for memory loss uh, for the ageless living in Riverdale. You began your transition during the COVID pandemic lockdown in 220 after many years of struggling with depression stemming from the thoughts and feelings about your gender identity and assigned sex. And this is a world that Dr. Goldenberg knows too painfully well. You are essential because on this panel, we asked you to be the person to be the lived experience that we're all talking about. And we're so appreciative that you can share your journey, but also really happy for you that you're having a more joyful outcome now. So welcome and thank you for being with us. Thank you, Sue, and thank you, everyone, for uh, coming on. This I'm overwhelmed by the the turnout here. It's wonderful. Um, and uh, Sue, as you you know talk about kind of you know being the person with the lived experience, I, I really do feel that you know speaking for such a large uh, and diverse uh, community. So um, you know that I feel that responsibility. You know you know, as I share about my own experience and how that might um, parallel with uh, the lived experience of, of others. Um, and I also wanna, you know, thank Dr. Johns and Dr. Goldenberg for everything they said. There was certainly a lot of uh, chords that resonated for me uh, and what they both talked on. And I'm sure I'll um, touch on those. I made some notes while they were speaking, um, the things I wanted to say, um, but I really want to, um, you know, start by recognizing perhaps some of my own privilege in many ways, you know, as a, as a white person and having been very blessed by so much support that I've received on all sides since coming out and um, living authentically, um, that I'm very aware of that not everyone is so fortunate and underscores the importance of, you know, all of the work that we're called upon as social workers to do, but really as a society and world that we're called to do. Um, so I was really debating with myself how to start my comments, but I think uh, the first place to start is probably the number one question that I've been asked, uh, which is, when did I know? Um, it's such a complicated question because it's hard to pinpoint, you know, a date and a time and go, oh, there, that was it. That's when I knew um, when I can really trace so many threads, you know, going back, you know, many years, even into childhood and adolescence, um, where I say, well, you know, my body and my feelings just didn't match. Um, so, but I think if there was any one moment that I could you know, go to, it was perhaps the day in uh, undergraduate in the late 90s, um, when I was fairly new to the internet, and the internet was new, maybe to us all at the time, um, that I discovered the word uh, transgender, um, perhaps not really knowing that word prior to that, you know, where was I going to find it in a public school? Was I going to find it on TV? Was I going to find it in a 
in the library, at, you know, in the city or at the school? Probably not. But that was really the moment when I knew, um, you know, what was going on with me. Um, and I did what many people do, which is, you know, I turned to where I felt like I could get the most information and the most support, which was actually the internet. <laughs> Unfortunately, um, there was really no, you know, visible campus presence where I went to school, you know, supporting, um, you know, you know, LGBTQ people. Um, I even have recollections of a barricade having been put up at the counseling office in my high school um, for, you know, for students who might want to conceivably go in there for something important. Uh, they were not even permitted. Um, and I remember in my research coming across um, a researcher by the name of Ray Blanchard, who might be familiar to some of you here. And unfortunately, what I learned from that was, well, this might be a pathology and something to be treated and cured rather than something to be accepted and understood. So what did that mean? Well, I learned really not to talk about it. I really learned to fake it, um, to make it. Um, and so the consequence of that, as you know, Sue said in my introduction, um, was a long time of depression, anxiety, kind of just stumbling my way, you know, through, you know, looking like I was doing fine, you know, successful, trying to have, you know, relationships, do all the things that you know, I'm supposed to do as a young adult, but, you know, those, those feelings, they don't really go away. Um, and I think Dr. Goldenberg talked about, you know, if we just give it enough time, you, you grow out of it. Well, nope, it's not how it works. You know, those feelings, you know, they, they stay with you and they don't really go away. Um, you can try to turn them off, but they aren't really ever turned off. Um, and so that's kind of how I was and how I lived for 22 years since, um, you know, kind of discovering the, the word and really up into the COVID pandemic <laughs> is really when um, it was kind of the, the moment that really, you know, you know, did it for me. Um, all those days at home, you know, not really going anywhere, not being part of any, you know, social circles or activities in the way that you could be before COVID when everything was locked down. And it was then that I realized, you know, if there's ever a time to do anything, it's now. And so um, I decided it was then to do something but it wasn't so simple. Um, I think, you know, particularly in what um, Dr. Johns highlighted earlier, um, there was an awful lot of fear around, you know, how are people going to react, you know, um, when I you know, talk with them, you know, can I trust, you know, the people around me who I felt I could trust, um, you know, will people accept me, you know, will I lose, you know, friends, family, relationships, job, you know, will all of these things happen? Um, I don't know. Um, certainly, I know people for whom those things have happened. Um, and, you know, it was really difficult to find the courage to speak to the first few people, but I'm really glad that I did. Um, and it really, you know, became an overwhelming crescendo of more and more you know, support from all sides. Um, so I feel so blessed and lucky, um, you know, because it's made my, you know, journey these past um, two and a half, three years, um, you know, just as beautiful as it can possibly be. So I hope, um, you know, to inspire some hope, you know, that with the right kind of support and the right kind of resources and, you um, you know, the uh, political and societal will, you know, to create the supportive space, um, you know, people can live fulfilling lives, you know, authentically, like I can. Um, I do want to, you know, touch on a number of things. I have a whole bunch of notes uh, that I made because there's just probably a lot of questions, you know, particularly about, um, 
you know, the journey and what it's been like. Um, but I think um, I, you know, was inspired by the questions that were asked before the lecture about, you know, what can people do to create a supportive space? And I'm happy to, you know, talk about some of the things that I experienced along the way, um, you know, to hope that we can learn from that. Um, and I think the first is that um, gender affirming healthcare is not always visible in the way that perhaps people would like, um, as a lot of people who might turn to, you know, um, to a doctor who could potentially help them and support them and understand them um, without judgment, um, isn't necessarily something that's easy to Google. Um, and even if you go to a practice's website, it's not always visible what, you know, you know, what services they offer in that regard. Um, now that's not true for all practices. And I was fortunate to find a practice um, that could actually see me, you know, during the 2020 lockdowns, very fortunate about that. Um, but in so doing, um, I found a lot of misinformation out there about, you know, what, you know, steps might be available to me, what, uh, you know, you know, what, uh, could hormones do for me? You know, what medical procedures are available to me? What can I expect? You know, what can I not expect? Um, so um, I think that's one thing that particularly social workers in healthcare, um, you know, and anyone in healthcare can, can do is, um, you know, make sure, um, you know, what you, what you offer to the community is visible. Um, it helps create that trust, you know, around, you know, this is a safe place to be. Um, this is not a place where you have to hide who you are, um, worry about people using uh, a name you don't prefer, using pronouns that don't reflect you, you know, those kinds of things. Um, so um, another thing I think is important to touch on um, is some of the systems in place um, within healthcare. Um, I think many um, use these electronic medical record systems that have a binary gender marker or lack of space to indicate a preferred name or pronouns, or even reject the idea of using chosen family as emergency contacts. Um, it goes back to this issue of, of trust. Um, you really want to know that you know those people you're you know you're sharing with are not. Um, you know, really going to undermine that by, you know, referring to you by a name you don't choose um, behind your back, use the wrong pronouns, or, um, or, you know, insist that someone in your family is your emergency contact when it might be better off to be a friend. Um, I think another thing, uh, perhaps that still stands out for me, is the, um, the presence of some outdated language uh, around, you know, being, you know, trans or gender nonconforming, envy, um, you know, um, same gender loving, any of that is some kind of a disorder. Um, you know, again, I said something to be treated and cured rather than something to be uh, accepted and understood. Um, as I recall, um, it wasn't until DSM-5 um, that, the language was updated there to, you know, describe things as gender dysphoria as opposed to gender identity disorder. 2013, that's only 10 years ago. Um, so um, I think that was a big part of why I didn't do anything uh, or even say anything until, um, you know, the landscape had been, you know, paved by those before me to, you um, you know, make it safer and easier for someone like myself, just as people like myself are paving the way for those to come later. Um, I think another thing to talk about um, is um, the insurance landscape. Um, this is certainly a battle that many people in my shoes uh, know. Um, many insurance companies have a very reductionist view uh, that uh, gender is essentially about anatomy. 
and that anything that is not about, you know, very specific anatomy, and by anatomy, I mean penises, vaginas, and breasts, uh, is considered cosmetic and therefore not covered under insurance. So that means anything related to voice, anything related to my facial hair, for example, um, not covered, have to pay with cash. Um, sorry, Audrey, you're out of luck. Um, I think that needs to be challenged because um, what any given person might want to do um, isn't necessarily related to having, you know, specifically uh, a top or a bottom surgery, um, you know, to be you know, authentic. Um, I think I'd also want to comment on the fact that in 50 states, there are 50 systems or non-systems in the case of some states for, you know, how people uh, like myself can be legally recognized. Um, you know, New York is exceptionally um, friendly in this regard. Um, you know, before Governor Cuomo left office, um, the Gender Recognition Act was passed, which actually removed a number of barriers for people like myself who wish to legally change name um, or things like that. It used to be that you had to publish your intention to change your name in a newspaper several times before it could be legally binding. Um, that's no longer true. Um, it certainly leads to chances for for bias, for discrimination, you know, for hate even, um, and crimes when you have to put yourself out there. So publicly, people might use that information, um, you know, to do um, some pretty horrible things. Um, you know, likewise, having been born in Minnesota, you know, <laughs> I can change my birth certificate, but I know there are states where that's not possible um, to do that. Um, and essentially anchoring a person in a past that, um, you know, forces them to confront a former name um, or a dead name, as we call it in the community. Um, and, um, you know, just, you know, again, creates more opportunities for bias, discrimination, hate, or worse. Um, and I do, you know, maybe want to conclude my remarks by saying, you know, I too am extremely troubled and nervous about all of the legislation targeting uh, trans uh, youth and adolescents and even adults in the case of the, um, the Florida legislation proposed. Um, and I think it underscores perhaps now more than ever um, that for journeys like mine to be possible, that we need an equally loud and strong voice on um, on this side, you know, saying um, that everything, <laughs> you know, that uh, the trans NBSGL community needs is, um, you know, you know, it's good for the country, it's good for mental health, and you know, it's just good, you know, for inclusion. Um, where I think no one would wish, you know, the depression and anxiety um, or other challenges like substance use and, and suicide that often visit, you know, you know, people who perhaps are not fortunate to have this kind of support uh, that they need. So um, I know I've talked a lot about a lot of different things and I certainly want to jump into the, the Q and A's. I know there've been a lot of questions um, but that was really my, um, my journey in a nutshell, and I hope you find it um, hopeful and inspiring um, as you look to, um, you know, perhaps people in your life or who you know, maybe personally or professionally, um, you know, who are uh, trans, NB, um, SGL. So thank you for listening. Thank you, Audrey. And I want to thank all of our panelists today. Um, the only word I can say right now is, wow, this was quite the lecture and presentation. Uh, hi, everyone. I am Jennifer March. I am Associate Director of Alumni Relations here at the School of Social Work, and I have the honor of moderating the Q&A for today. I'd like to invite all of our panelists and speakers to uh, turn on their cameras and their microphones while uh, so we can get started on the Q&A. Uh, we did ask folks to submit questions 
ahead of the program when they registered. And uh, if anybody has been looking in the Q&A box while uh, you were listening to the program, you will see that there are a lot of comments and questions there. And uh, all goes to show what, a, what a, a timely topic this is for everybody. So let's get started. And um, knowing that there's so much information we can go through, I am just going to start at the top and ask, oh, first, actually, I'm not going to start quite at the top. Um, Dr. Johns, we had a question in the Q&A uh, very early on, and obviously I did not want to interrupt you. What is IEPA? What does that stand for? Sorry, those are, uh, I appreciate the question. You were paying attention. Those are informal <laughs> programs and activities. Um, and so I was trying to draw a circle around the things that are not traditionally considered within the context of the curriculum between the hours of eight and five. So they're after school programs that might be operated by a community-based program. They might be clubs that a teacher hosts um, connected to GLSEN or GSA. So any of those things that are informal educational programs or activities. Thanks for that question, and thanks, Audrey, and others for using SGO. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, okay, now to the top of the list here. Um, should a person who identifies as transgender delay decisions about surgical interventions until they are past adolescence? Uh, I am just going to open that up. Uh, maybe uh, Dr. Goldenberg, maybe you'd like to answer that question first. Um, okay. Um, should they delay surgery until after adolescence or until adolescence? Um, uh, WPATH has, um, WPATH 8, there's um, standards of care, uh, say specifically, that of course no surgery is um, for, for children. Um, but I think the way, the, I'm gonna be a little, um, I don't know, persnickety here. The way the question was phrased, should they delay decisions? I don't know about that. Should they delay surgery until adolescence? Um, well, they're, they may need to delay it until they're 18 which is not necessarily to say that they're no longer an adolescent and they may need to delay it until some form, but this is, the decision is, a, is different than the action. And that might be too, um, I don't know, too much. I, I think it's an important distinction when you're working with somebody and some people come, they have made the decision and really um, they're not able to because of either parental consent or their consent or gatekeeping rules or, now states, you know, in, uh, decreasing access. Um, so to be a little more practical about, uh, maybe to help answer the question, um, I might say which surgery and when in adolescence. Um, so to separate the decision from actually the action. And the action is of course limited by where and where and the specific family of person. But I, and also the individual. For somebody who, and again, sort of like Audrey's experience, you know, when do you know? When does the child know? When does the adolescent know? Um, surgery can be, I think, here we have experience and we're gaining experience where we have interventions that resolve anxiety, depression, and suicidality by creating a um, continuity and synchrony between the individual's experience of themselves and their body. And I think, why would we prolong that torture and that suffering um, when, you know, with the fantasy that, um, that adolescence will resolve things? Why not, if we can, and I think it depends on the surgery, again, and, and the developmental level of the adolescent. Um, I think I think saying no is too much into the binary desistance, I fear, 
And saying yes is, I, I can't give a blanket yes answer to that, you know, because I, but I, um, again, maybe it says no children. And then the decision can be made, I think, whenever, <laughs> um, and the action is different from the decision. And, you know, we, it, it, and I think it would also depend what an adolescence now, are they on puberty blockers or not? Um, and then there's going to be a, a cosmetic um, issue involved in it, just practical surgical. So if someone's on puberty blockers, I forget, actually, you don't want them necessarily to enter into adolescence. You have too many um, bodily changes. Um, but if they're not on puberty blockers, then um, where are they along the, the path? The fear is that they'll, oh, they'll regret, or that now the, the what's articulated in the laws is that this is assault and battery, and that children are incapable of making consent. Um, and that's also, uh, I, I think, fear-based and um, childism. And um, and yet, you know, before any procedure, you want to sort of really think about it. But again, if it's going to be, and this is the hardest part in some ways, if it, if this if if a surgical procedure can solve this asynchrony that may be causing this extreme distress that you know Audrey talked about even and, and has been documented, why wouldn't we do it? It's not widely available. It's, it's obviously going to be. I, I I don't mean to be glib, but I do mean to say you know let's think about it. We can pause, but we shouldn't pause forever, and we shouldn't pause while someone too long while someone is an individual is suffering. What do you guys think? Sorry. Well, say, I guess I would add, Dr. Goldenberg, that even if one doesn't, you know, take any action in adolescence, that it doesn't necessarily mean um, <laughs> um, that these things aren't available later in life. Perhaps it makes some things challenging, perhaps undoing, you know, some of the effects of, of male puberty in my case, yes. Um, but it you know, I think it would be remiss to say that if you'd miss it, you know, be, you know, before or right at the start of puberty, it doesn't mean um, that you cannot, you know, live your best life. Um, right. So I guess that's what I would add, you know, having transition um, in adulthood. Uh, that, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm glad you added that. Yeah. Um, uh, very much related. Um, two things. One is, um, these decisions should be made in consultation with doctors who take Hippocratic oaths um, to ensure the wellness of their patients, um, also in concert with families, and that is being disrupted by elected leaders who know nothing about um, care um, or medical provision. Um, the second thing is, it, it is never lost on me that there is um, so little discussion um, and contemplation around similar questions with regard to elective cosmetic surgeries for non-trans, non-queer people. Um, I'm just gonna leave that there. Okay, thank you all. Sounds like a much more complicated question than, uh, or answer than yes or no. Uh, lots of things to consider. Uh, we have a question, knowing that the top cause of death for children in school shootings what, so, what can social workers and allies alike do to support the LGBTQIA children in school? Dr. Johns, we'll start with you on that one. Um, yeah, three things. One is that everybody can engage in encouraging the adoption of policies that limit or otherwise prohibit um, firearms in schools and the, um, the presence of school resource officers or police officers on campus. Um, that's one and two, and then pushing to ensure that during this upcoming midterm election cycle that um, uh, policies and politicians who are advancing responsible gun control are elected, I think is first and foremost. Um, outside of that, ensuring that our babies feel safe and protected in schools is important. Um, so pushing past these limitations on bans, using terms that they identify with that are comfortable, um, asking young people, how do you want me to refer to you today? How do you want me to refer to you in front of your peers? How do you want me to refer to you in front of your parents? Is a helpful practice um, for lots of reasons, including ones that I won't go into. Um, and then the third is symbolic representation. Um, so black feminists refer to the matrix of domination, the signs, systems, and symbols that allow white supremacy in this context 
uh, patriarchy and cis heteronormativity to be omnipresent, yet hyper invisible. So using signs and symbols, whether they be rainbow flags or images of folks like Marsha P. Johnson uh, to disrupt the erasure of members of our community um, are incredibly important uh, on schools, at schools rather. Anything to add? Uh, I would Goldberg, add Audrey? Sure, I would add, um, you know, don't take the money away from mental health services and schools and don't put barricades in front of the counseling office. Very important. Dr. Goldenberg, yes, Dr. Johns. Oh. Sorry, that was silent, that was silent affirmation. Uh, oh, <laughs> my apologies. <laughs> I, I, they, they've answered it. I, 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 I can't, um, I, I'm still trying to comprehend the gun risk in this country. Um, it, 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 it's incomprehensible. Um, but I, you, I mean, for me, but you, you, you have a greater handle on that. Also, when, when, no, going backwards, I think that my position that I stated, or what I was saying also is informed as by a certain privilege that I have that Audrey and um, David or Dr. Johnson and Ms. Swanson don't have. Um, so I can freely, you know, state that in, in, for my position in a different way. I'm um, just that you did mention that Audrey, and I think that, um, I, you know, I, I, I'll do I, the affirmation that to, for you too, um, you know, as we're on this panel, uh, yeah, each of us has a different um, perspective and experiences, so. Thank you very much. Uh, question, how can we support older adult, adults who are part of this community? Uh, Audrey, do you wanna take this one? Sure, <laughs> it feels very appropriate, you know, given my, given my work. Um, I think one of the most important things again um, is making this kind of um, support visible in your, in your, particularly in your forms and sort of in how you train your staff. Um, I think um, you know it's easy to look at a, a you know registration form for a, a typical kind of a program and you know get caught into the you know the binary gender markers you know check the box uh, don't leave a space for pronouns don't leave a space for a preferred name or insist upon a legal name or something like this um, but it's also I think in you know cultivating an attitude for um, you know, for inclusion, you know, not just for, you know, uh, trans, queer, SGL people, but also just in general. Um, I know, um, you know, at RSS, um, we all did this uh, training from SAGE, which um, some of you may be familiar with. Um, and I think that kind of heightens the awareness around things like, like language, you know, like how, you know, certain kinds of questions can, um, you know, lead to, you um, an unsupportive or perhaps even hostile kind of environment. Um, so I think those are some ways, um, but it really starts with the person, um, you know, maybe checking their, their attitudes um, and their feelings and their assumptions um, even before they start work um, and might potentially uh, meet a client or a family. Great, thank you. Anyone else care to add? I guess what is, how do we define older? Uh, right. I, I know someone who transitioned at 55 um, and some of the support is um, acknowledging her. Um, she is proud of who she was before and that built a foundation for who she can be now, you know, in her later. Yeah. Yeah, I'll add one more thing, which is acknowledging that development is dynamic. Um, too often, uh, images around LGBTQIA plus people freeze us as uh, young, often clad in rainbows during pride parades. Um, but if we're supported and we do this right, we age and grow older um, and have different experiences. I have a mentor who is a bishop um, in San Francisco who was married to a husband who with him raised three children, um, who has also lived a very full life loving uh, a woman of the same gender. Um, and so appreciating that this process of development is not one 
um, that has only enjoyed our experience by children are fixed in terms of defined period and time. So we create spaces for people to feel comfortable. Inviting us in is important. Um, I don't like the term coming out. It's like nails on a chalkboard in part because not everybody is expected to do it. Um, Audrey started by naming the question of, when did you know? I often like to ask folks who ask me that, well, when did you know? Most often because straight cis people have never even contemplated their answer while expecting us to have one. Um, and so my hope is that if we do all of this right, um, people will invite in and share the important parts of their lives and experiences um, that matter. Um, and that happens over the course of one's lifetime. Thank you very much. Uh, let's see, I do not like the term gender nonconformity as it implies duality that heterosexual is, con is conforming and quote normal and non-heterosexual is not. To me, this term is adding to discrimination and dividing people rather than being inclusive. I am wondering about the about your thoughts on this. I'll take this one. I responded to it a bit in real time. Three things. Uh, words are dynamic. Um, I refer to myself as Black. Uh, my parents uh, uh, use African American. Uh, their parents use Negro. Um, each of those terms are different ways of people finding uh, comfort. Um, using terms that have been often defined after we have um, uh, figured out how we want to identify the spaces we move through. So I just want to underscore that some of this is dynamic. Uh, this is also why you find young people now disregarding all of the terms that have existed here too for and using things like Zizem Zare uh, to get past uh, some of these challenges. Um, uh, and so I, I want to celebrate uh, what you're raising. Uh, I want to name similar lead to um, a point that I responded to around queer, uh, that some of this is more about providing room for people to identify themselves than forcing people to use terms that don't fit comfortably for them. Thank you. That was a great answer. Dr. Goldenberg, anything to add? Oh, I, I agree. Um, I use the term. Um, I'm, I'm going to think about it a little bit differently now. Um, I'm glad that issue was raised, but I, I, I do agree. It's, it, I see the problematic issue um, and I'm trying not to um, uh, reinforce the binary constantly. And I think it'll be some time in, and yet there are, um, let's see, th there are elements of and expressions that seem to map more onto a spectrum of male or female. And so that's a binary spectrum that I think is not necessarily the way to think about it. Um, and we'll have to, and maybe the language can um, catch up with our thinking and our thinking can catch up with the advances that mostly youth um, uh, driven advances in language. Um, and yet we, you know, to, Conservative with a little c, we know that there are sort of gender typical behaviors, uh, rough and tumble play, et cetera. And yet um, I think, and that's supported sort of by years of research and we have to interrogate this language, the cisgendered bias in that as well. Um, and, um, but it, it's, a, it's a really, I, it's a very, I think it's a very interesting point that I, my gut reaction is definitely to agree with, um, but I don't, I don't have, the actual words for, um, I'm not sure what words I would use to replace it at this point. Um, I don't know, what okay. is, Audrey or David, you know? Well, no, I sorry. Can, sure, I can see the problematic issue as well, but you know, being someone who does identify on the binary, I'm probably not the best person to comment on that because it's not my lived experience. Um, but I know, you know, often the words people choose are chosen by themselves, you know, and so I think it's always wise to reflect back language that people reflect to you. Um, and that's often the, the safest, um, you know, rather than sort of guessing that you might know what that language is, um, because you might get it wrong. And then that undermines, you know, the trust that you're trying to build. Right. Our next question, what resources are available to help 
undocumented or uninsured transgender individuals navigate the healthcare system? And then what options are available for transgender individuals who cannot afford gender affirming medical care due to financial constraints? Can anyone speak to this? Who would like to start or try? Um, I can certainly speak to the second question, perhaps okay. more than the first, about the okay. financial issue. Um, it's such an enormous issue um, because, you know, many, um, you know, particularly medical treatments are prohibitively expensive, um, that without insurance coverage, it would not be an option for, you know, most, you know, uh, people. Um, and so... Um, I'm not sure what options there are, you know, other than, you know, creative saving and trying to find a, a health plan, you know, that can, you know, provide that coverage. Um, I mean, just the cost of uh, HRT alone is prohibitive when you consider the lab work um, involved to make sure um, the hormones are doing what the prescriber hopes that they're doing um, and not causing other health problems at the same time. Um, even though the hormones themselves uh, um, may not be expensive at all. Um, but I know, you know, you know, the typical, you know, bottom or top surgery is, you know, five or even six figures, depending on where you go. You know, I don't know very many people have that kind of cash around. Right. <laughs> Anybody like to weigh in on this one? I don't know. Um, it's, I, I think back to what, uh, Dr. John said earlier about policies, public policies, how do we, you know, take to the streets for that and change those. Right. And while, uh, uh states are attempting to restrict access, there are opportunities for folks who are privileged enough to have employers to leverage um, private and employee-based support services. And so I'd ask about those um, while they still exist before your legislature attempts to take them away. Great, thank you. Uh, some folks are answering here. Uh, there are funds specifically for trans folks looking for financial support with medical transition. Um, there is a link in the Q&A uh, area as well. Uh, I'll try to throw that into the um, into the chat box in a little bit. Uh, .org is good for that. And there are lots of local uh, community-based organizations that participate in mutual exchange. Uh, I would encourage everyone to ask a young person in their life to help them figure out how to navigate TikTok or Instagram or Twitter to identify those individual leaders in the communities that can also connect you to those community-based organizations. But also if you Google um, trans and mutual aid funds, you should be able to find them in part because organizations like NBJC attempt to highlight them for this very reason. Great, thank you very much. Uh, so how about, let's move to the political landscape for a little bit. Uh, how can we help instill hope when the political landscape is so bleak for trans folks targeted by legislation in many states? Dr. Johns, do you wanna take this one first? Um, sure, I was also trying to type in the chat, this is my adult ADHD, um, the Marsha B. Johnson Institute um, so what I would offer three things. One is support uh, currently existing elected officials who are trans, non-binary, non-conforming, and otherwise queer. Um, after this lecture conversation concludes, I'm going to have a call with the reporter about um, uh, Zephyr, who is an elected leader in Montana, who was recently sanctioned by their colleagues for naming that they're going to have blood in their hands uh, for taking steps to prevent this kind of affirming care. Um, and Marie Turner is the first uh, Muslim and Black non-binary elected leader in Oklahoma who was also sanctioned by their colleagues for doing their job and protecting a constituent. Um, so standing in support for elected leaders who are often standing by themselves while speaking on behalf of their constituents and community members is incredibly important. Uh, NBJC hosts a network of Black LGBTQIA plus elected leaders. It's called the Good Trouble Network named in the spirit of Congressman John Robert Lewis, my birthday buddy. Um, so that's one way to find at least Black folks who are working in that space. Um, the second is to support people you know 
um, who are thoughtful, who are compassionate, who are critical thinkers, and who are queer, trans, and non-binary and running for office at every level, whether that be school board or local municipality um, or state level office or Congress, we need more representation um, at every level. Um, and then the third is to show up and be disrupted. Often um, there are people who are privileged and in positions of power who are showing up and being disruptive and uh, forcing democracy um, to work to their benefit, um, finding ways to link arms and aims in the words of Susan Taylor to show up together um, to be righteous in defense of democracy is what's called for at this very moment. Thank you. Uh, Audrey or Dr. Goldenberg, any, any follow-up with that? No? Visibility? Just echoing, um, yeah. Uh, yeah, visibility. Okay. It's being, it's, I didn't mean to cut you off, Dr. Goldberg, but it's being as, you know, sort of visible and loud, you know, as the opponents, you know, really, you know, because, you know, there's a voice here too, you know, and it often can get drowned out, you know, in the extreme, you know, nature, like, look how crazy this legislation is, <laughs> you know, where we're going to even go after adults, you know, who, who are trans and, you know, deputize citizens and strip medical licenses away and look how these crazy things that we can do you know then then you get this outrage fatigue <laughs> um you know and then it kind of gets people into this state of oh my god there's just so much awful things that what can i do well you also have a voice and a vote right and most people listening to us have much more privilege than uh, i have i'll just speak for myself um so often uh, white people, white cis people, white heterosexual cis people are asking me how to be an ally. Uh, that's also a term I hate because people are now purchasing ally jerseys rather than uh, being uh, acknowledged as such by the community. Uh, and so this is an example of how people can be active accomplices is by leveraging your privilege to speak up about issues that should not require you having intimate personal experience to otherwise defend access to safety and full participation in democracy. Okay, thank you. Thank you both for that. Uh, so the time, I'm just trying to be mindful of time. I know we have a hard stop at eight o'clock. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, and this will be, uh, someone wrote in, I am concerned about the underreporting on the trans suicide connection. Are there any federal efforts to collect this data? Does anybody know the answer to Short that? Answer is no, <laughs> we are still fighting with the uh, with the census uh, to ensure more meaningful and disaggregated data that uh, contemplates sexual identity, gender orientation, or expression. That continues to be a challenge. There's been more progress with regard to employment. Uh, EEOC has more practices that are inclusive that speak to some of the opportunities that Audrey mentioned. Uh, but the short answer is no. As it relates to mental health, Congresswoman Bonnie Watson Coleman, who is a member of the Congressional Black Caucus who established a caucus around mental health has introduced legislation, um, has successfully secured, um, I forget how many millions of dollars to be invested in this regard, but there is not a concerted or um, clear effort to address um, exactly this issue. To be clear, um, as intimated in the responses I heard it, um, that number is likely an undercount um, in part because um, black trans students are often uh, not significantly represented in studies. Um, and because of the, the challenges associated with folks identifying as both black and trans or non-conforming in public. Um, so suffice it to say is that it is a problem. It is likely more of a problem than we acknowledge. And there has not been heretofore the kind of congressional or federal attention or championing um, that, that this issue deserves. Dr. Goldenberg, have you heard of uh, unusually high numbers of uh, suicide rates? Um, um, th there is an increased suicide and rate and risk. And also there's an increase, um, I've heard from emergency room physicians about an uh, overrepresentation in, in the, um, people presenting to the emergency room um, identifying um, either gender, they identify, sorry to use the term again, gender non-conforming or trans specifically. And, um, but um, 
efforts to look at this specifically, I, I know that in, in, in collecting the data, there used to be just like one question or two questions that were not, didn't really capture it. And now I think there is an effort, I don't know nationally on a, from the census, but certainly research wise, we get more questions to try and capture um, people, the spectrum of identity and, um, and presentations of, of self um, to try and link that to, um, to try and to correlate. Now correlation, as we know, is not causation. We don't know what causes what here, but there is an um, attempt to, to, do it, to identify um, the risk factors and, and more people, at least in the research. But nationally, um, um, well, actually, this doesn't really relate. Um, the research used to be just in uh, local research, and now they're trying to do more nationally too. Thank you very much. So I'd like to thank everybody for joining us today. And I'd like to thank our panelists. Thank you so much. We have many more questions here, but sadly, we cannot get to them all. Uh, I do want to bring Susan Matterin back. Uh, and uh, she will close us out for the evening. Susan. Um, we started with some, I did at least, feelings of despair and helplessness about the bigotry and brutal assaults going on all around the country. This is a very complex topic and it was just wonderful to have panelists address complexity without getting reductionistic about something so complicated. Um, you gave us hope because you shared knowledge and there's something very heartening about knowledge and shared values and being with a community of people that are doing both and sharing that. This is a brilliant, outstanding panel. We're deeply indebted to you. And we were concerned about drop off at the end of a long work day. And I should tell you that we had 402 people signed up and very little drop off this evening. So have a wonderful evening and know how much you've given us um, so much to think about. And we hope to invite you back. Thank you for joining us. <laughs>